Hi everybody, I'm back speaking with Dr. Jake Glanville. Um, there's a lot going on. We're in a much different place than where we were the last we spoke, which is about two weeks ago. So Jake, thanks for speaking with me and uh, how you doing? Doing good, tired. You know, we're moving into the acceleration phase. Uh, California has started passing a whole bunch of those social distancing measures that we talked about last time that I felt were really necessary. And we're starting to see that in a whole bunch of other states in the United States and other countries. That's that's the good news. Uh, it was very worrying that those were not put in place. I wish they'd happened a couple weeks earlier, but that means that we are going to start applying the mitigation efforts to slow down the rate that people get sick and go to the hospital. So that, that is the good news. So Jake, what's a good way to put this in perspective for people to understand this historical moment that we're in? We're really living in an unprecedented moment. And I want people to just stop, uh, take their heads out of the sand for a second, just look around and realize what they're, what they're living through right now. We're, we're in this one in a century event where the whole world is shut down and has to go into hiding to avoid um, us all getting infected with a pretty dangerous virus. Right now, is it fair to say that what's happening in Italy is what's going to happen to us at some point in the near future? Yeah, so there's you know, a couple of major trajectories we can look to. We can look to the South Korean case, which is the rosiest. Um, they had a big outbreak, but they started surveillance on everybody early, and they're managing to slow that outbreak. Uh, Italy's on the other end of that spectrum. They got caught with a pretty big outbreak without a lot of surveillance, and they're overrunning their, their hospitals and their ICUs. So I think they had something like 3,600 new cases just today. And it's confusing for people to go from like their normal lives and suddenly there's this big inflection point and everyone's hiding inside and they're sick in the hospital. And I think we're starting to experience that. Like you now, California and Seattle and New York, I mean, we're, we're next. It feels different. Uh, and to be honest, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get worse. We're, we're entering the next eight to 12 weeks is going to be where there's the major acceleration um, in many states across the United States that like what we've seen in Italy. So we, we should just make sure we're preparing well for that, um, stocking up our hospitals, and then just realizing it's, it's going to get rough. It's Sunday evening right now, and just recently I saw an alert that the CDC is saying we shouldn't have gatherings of more than 50 people. New York City finally shut down the public school system. Do you think people are going to start to get how severe this is? I know I have some friends who still don't believe it, still don't believe the hype. They think it's just the flu. They think it's not going to get bad. Uh, they say that the flu kills more people. And what I'm trying to do is to explain to them that that's just not the right outlook. So what do you say to people who doubt how bad this is and how bad it's going to be? So it's a balanced message, right? Because I, I don't want to panic people. You know? <laughs> Society will not get destroyed by this and we will go on. But at the same time, this is far worse than flu. It's much more deadly and it's much more infectious. And it is true that more people die from the flu so far. And that's because flu is a ridiculous disease where it's an annual pandemic that we put up with that goes around the world and, about, you know, could be easily 40 or 50,000 Americans uh, get sick. But the huge difference with flu is that we have medicine. We have uh, antivirals. We have vaccines and we have existing immunity because our bodies have experienced it before. So it goes throughout the community, uh, but, but we, you know, have, we have ways to treat it. When you go to a hospital, it's less than one in a thousand people that die from the flu, where comparatively it might be two or 3% of people that are dying from COVID-19. And in places like Italy, it's up to seven or 8%. So it, this thing is easily 20 times more lethal uh, than, than influenza. Uh, it's, different than MERS and SARS. Those things were scary if you were at the locations where the outbreak took place, but they were, they got you sick so fast that the outbreaks never really blew up because people would get sick quickly and you could contain them. Where the really nefarious thing about the novel coronavirus is that while many people get sick after three days, there's a large population of people that don't get sick for up to 14 days or they really never show symptoms, but during that period they can infect others. And so that, that gives rise to a Trojan horse problem where you just can't contain this thing. It gets out, people are infecting a lot more people. And, and because of that, uh, this thing's more than twice as infectious compared to influenza. So these are the reasons why countries for good reason are responding um, very seriously and locking things down. So I don't think it's an overreaction. I think it's the right set of choices to try to mitigate 
uh, the, the outbreak, they're, you know, and they're making a hard decision. They don't want to shut down their economies by sending everyone home. But you realize that the damage caused by destroying your hospital systems and shutting down your economy by everyone being sick is actually worse. So in that case, that calculation, that brutal decision is, is falling in most states on the, on the side of, of mitigation. So there's two phases to an outbreak. First, you try containment, which is to say, keep people from getting in your country. But once it's in all the countries, you give up on that. And then you shift to mitigation, which is trying to get people from, from spreading from house to house, not from country to country. And that's really where we are right now. This thing is global. It's super infectious. It's much more lethal than the flu. And we have no current medicines to stop it. So I don't want to panic people with that. But that is the reason why this should be taken seriously. I think when I look around, I think, you know, my Californians who most of them are starting to suddenly take it seriously over the last week, but you have some that still aren't. And I think it's because you look around and you don't see everybody dying around you. And so it still feels unreal. Um, but I would encourage those people to go check out some of the videos from Italy or from Iran or China, or South Korea, right? Like we live in a magical world of the internet where you can stare through your computer like a crystal ball and stare into other people's lives. And if you look over there, you'll realize how serious this is and how disruptive it is. It's so serious. And so when I tell people that there's no vaccine, there's no natural immunity, there's no medicine for this yet. We already have a, a, like you said, a recurring flu pandemic that we just deal with every year as a seasonal flu. It's, it's deadlier and it's more infectious. That's all true. Yeah, so the thing so far compared to flu is there were less people totally infected, right? So the flu infects you know hundreds of millions of people a year where this thing is, that we've documented it's got less than 200,000 infections now we know more people than that are being infected that we're not measuring but it's comparatively affected less people that's why it feels like less of a problem in the flu but because it has the potential to be much worse that's why we're more worried about this than we are with flu uh, again uh i want people to be informed and prepared uh but i don't want them to panic so the the, re the good news is that uh there are new medicines that are coming Biotechnology is better than it ever has been in making new medicines. Uh, uh, good social policies have been instituted in many states throughout the world and the states within the United States to try to um, mitigate the, the spread of the virus. There are lessons learned by Chinese and South Korean medical folks who ran into the virus first, and that's being shared with hospitals elsewhere on types of medicines and measures that can be taken that might help a little bit while we're waiting for a proper medicine to help out here. And in the meantime, the, the, the social distancing measures and the sanitation measures are absolutely working. So it comes at great economic cost, but we can see China and South Korea absolutely succeeded in, in slowing, stemming the, the outbreak. And that means that it's, it's not a foregone conclusion that everybody has to get sick. And so those are the positive things to look forward to. But in the meantime, we need to be realistic that we are on the, the up ramp of uh, increasing accelerated infections. So when we look to Italy, we look to Iran, we look to South Korea, we look to China, they're, they're basically a few weeks into the future of the same trajectory that we are on now. And we're going to see those same kinds of outbreaks. In the United States, it's going to be Seattle, New York, and the Bay Area are hitting first. And then we're already entering in that acceleration phase. And over the next three weeks, we're going to run into major problems with being able to maintain uh, enough spaces in hospitals for all the people who are getting sick. Um, and then after that, there's a second wave of a whole bunch of other locations throughout the United States and are going to enter into a problem of just not having enough people and host doctors and nurses and beds to build a house that people are sick. And that's going to have the effect of increasing the, the mortality rate because people are going to be dying in the waiting room with no oxygen. It's all really scary. There's obviously positive things to focus on too. I know last time we spoke, you were telling me that you and your team were using biotechnology to sort of engineer 18 year old SARS antibodies so that they could catch up to this coronavirus. So um, I just wanted to check in with that. If you want to talk about it, um, I wanted to check in and, and see where you guys sure. are with, with your efforts. So we've made a lot of progress there. Um, we've been continuing to engineer those. I just want to shout out to um, Sherrod and Jack, Sousen, JP, Sarah, other team members of mine that have been um, working on those programs. Um, and we're anticipating the engineering to be complete and that's to have molecules on the week of the 6th or the, the 13th. So just in a couple weeks out, um, coming into April, we're gonna be done with that engineering exercise. We've uh, partnered with a company called Swift Scale. They can, once we've completed the engineering of the molecule, they can produce these big vats like beer of like hundreds of liters of 
of culture to produce large batches of the antibody. And we've been coordinating with DARPA and US AMRID um, to help accelerate it. So the military is going to run tests for us on our drug to see, does it block the new coronavirus from infecting cells? Does it block SARS and might it even block MERS? They can also run an animal study for us. And we're pulling together the, the timeline and the resources right now to be able to, um, assuming we can cut through some red tape faster than normal, um, go through this manufacturing process that needs to get approved called GMP. And then we go into the first uh, human phase trial and that's gonna happen over the summer. The nice thing about an antibody is you can give it to, to sick folks. So vaccines, you have to give it for six or nine weeks before it would be effective and antibody works right away. So you'd give it to 600 people um, characterize the responses. And if you find that it's efficacious, then at that point, as soon as that study's done, and that study is quick, that's each patient you're monitoring for like 10 days, and you have, you're, they're either recovered or not at that point. Um, at that point, you have your information, and then you can start transitioning into a phase two slash three, but you can also create this thing called a compassionate use um, case, where if you can grow up very large batches of it, as provided it's safe and it's effective, you could just start distributing that to hundreds of thousands of people who need it. So that, that's our strategy. Um, even with all the red cape cut and under the ideal scenarios, we don't contemplate being in that position until September. So there's still a period where we, you know, we kind of contribute to help with it. So yeah, Swift Scale is a cool company. So, you know, we're kind of agnostic. We can like, we can engineer the antibody to cross and we just wanted to work with someone who could help scale it up really quick. And the, uh, the good folks at Swift Scale, I, I knew about their company for some other reasons. And they just came over one day and they said, Hey, uh, so we have this cool technology. We can scale up the drug faster than anybody else. We hear you might have the drug. And I'm like, well, by April 6th, maybe April 13th, I will. And so they partnered with us and they've just been great partners. They like, it was like the, uh, you know, the elves coming over the hill and Lord of the Rings when like the, <laughs> the humans are like down to their last man. They offered, they came in and they offered me additional scientists to help accelerate the stuff we were doing to help us work together to get the, the drug ready faster. So they're talking to DARPA and US Amarid with us. So this sort um, of thing allows you to, to scale up quickly and yeah. efficiently. We need these big old, like they look like they look like beer fermentation tanks and that's how we're making these medicines. And, uh, and you, you need a whole bunch of those because it's just like people drink a lot of beer, you're gonna want a lot of this medicine. I hope we see a lot of giant beer vats filled with this <laughs> antibody in the near future. Yeah, yeah so do I. <laughs>